So, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we, we hope you managed to have a few moments of fresh air or something else for your break. Uh, goodness me, that was uh, a really interesting first session. And uh, I think in conversation of designing this, I think the thought of actually uh, having that session first, where we're really looking at connections to impacts on and engagement with those communities uh, directly affected, both positively and negatively by uh, potential developments, um, was, a, was a sharp end way to bring some of these issues into focus. Um, what we plan to do in this session to take us through to the end of day one um, is looking very much at industry front runners and business alliances. We've heard um, that clearly there is a drive uh, towards uh, responsible sourcing, that this is uh, maybe most effectively achieved not when individual companies just do their thing, though they have a role, but when actually sectors and alliances work uh, collaboratively um, in trying to ensure some sense of a level playing field in that journey towards responsible sourcing. Not easy in what is a, a very competitive, uh, fast moving world. Uh, but in this session, what we hope to do is to highlight some of the initiatives and activities that are taking place. We'll also give you an opportunity to share your experiences about what's going on in this field, and then open up a panel discussion on what this is telling us in terms of uh, the way forward. Uh, is there a real effective drive um, uh, around the development of, of business alliances and key industries showing a lead? Uh, or do we need to be thoughtful and cautious in what is going on? So that's the plan. Um, one of our uh, sectors that's being uh, highlighted within the resourcing um, uh, conference uh, is around mobility uh, and obviously there is a remarkable transition going on within the automotive world, that world from uh, diesel and uh, petrol through to alternatives, particularly um, electric vehicles. Um, and to uh, delight of this afternoon we have with us uh, Nick uh, Alexander from BMW. Uh, Nick's uh, responsibilities include helping to steer the BMW Group sustainability strategy and integrating sustainability into business functions with a focus very much on the supply chain. Um, that's, a, that's a big task, uh, but Nick, it's great to have you uh, with us. Thank you very much for uh, spending some of your time uh, sharing some of the insights coming from uh, BMW, but also particularly in the whole arena of building those alliances. So, um, Nick, uh, over to you. Thanks a lot, Peter. Thanks for the invitation and to be able to introduce for the next 10, 15 minutes a bit how we at BMW Group um, explore the case for responsible sourcing alliances. Next slide, please. So a bit where we are coming from and what, what, what is central for the success uh, of the BMW group. So we put sustainability to the core of what we are doing. And last year we ramped up, to be, we, we further developed our strategy, integrated sustainability into our core group strategy, focusing on the one side on the Paris Climate Agreement and on the other side on environmental and social standards. Now, Peter, as you already said, with, um, with, with an increased electrification, we also see that the footprint will further move into our supply chain from a CO2 perspective, but also from an environmental and social perspective. And the latter one is what I will now focus on in the, in the, next, uh, in the next minutes. Next slide, please. Here you see a quote, a recent quote from our CPO. So for us, it is really that we would like to lead this debate in, in the BMW Group way, together with partners and based on internationally accepted standards, so that at the end of the day, we, 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 we find a way to put the standards across our full supplier network. Knowing that's not easy, knowing it is a complex network, we started 
if you look at the next slide, please, quite, quite some years ago in, 20, uh, in, in 2008, the Project I put an emphasis on sustainability. So we learned at that time quite a lot on how to deal with life cycle analysis, on how to, um, on how to adhere to environmental social standards. So we looked at individual components and parts of our vehicles and had some really good early on learnings. In 2014, we then put this further and, and, and put up a due diligence process for all our products. We set up a department for sustainability in our procurement department. And then since 2018, um, we follow the OECD due diligence guidance um, and elaborate them and, and, and get them trying to get them better and better uh, year to year. Next slide, please. So if you look here at a few of the, of the key points of the program that we are running and um, the impact that we would like to create with, those, with this program. So obviously, yes, we look at stakeholder expectations and anticipation of future requirements. At the end of the day that we are able to be ahead and that we can enter a smoother transition. We set up a pretty comprehensive risk management approach and outlook so that we can really get a more resilient supply chain. We look at supply chain mappings, we look at transparency based on ESG aspects so that we can really generate synergy effects that we can improve our overall and environmental and social compliance and performance. We participate in standardization initiatives and we do we do um, go into ground projects, into field projects, so that we can, for us, really claim a leadership ambition and that we can also generate economies of scale. We do support EU-wide regulation because we strongly believe that we need to create a level playing field. Next slide, please. So the four elements here um, put together in, in, in a pyramid also to see where do we start and where do we end. Obviously, quite, quite a while as, as, as I laid out, we look at our first tier supplier management. So the objective there is that our sustainability standards are met by all our first tier suppliers as a foundation. We then as a next step, look at our end tier risk supplier management so that we really can see that the sustainability standards are also met by end tier risk suppliers. As a third component, we then look how sustainability standards can derive um, and can, can really go across critical supply chains. So there we look a lot on sustainability standards um, in, in, together with alliances. So that at the end of the day, the critical raw material supply chains, uh, there's no way that, that an individual player can, um, can secure. So that is really the setup for an effective alliance. And on the fourth element, if we then look at the raw material level, can we also initiative change and deliver positive impact if we go into local capacity building engagements? Next slide, please. We have learned quite a bit. And here is a slide that puts together the different levels of engagement. So from the left to the right, you see there's an increased level of engagement. So we start from um, due diligences up to um, pilot projects. If you click once more, then you see how, um, um, how we are doing it and what are a few examples of it. So if you come to due diligence, together with drive sustainability, so we cascade um, the requirements um, up the supply chain to the first tier and from the first tier suppliers as it's part of the criteria also to, to their first tier, so to our tier two suppliers. For OECD due diligence, we look at we, we look at hotspots, so transparency from mind to smelter. So we are engaged with the with the RMI, looking at three TGs, looking at cobalt. As a third level, we we look at existing certifications. So may it be in for a stewardship council for wood, or also as um, we have now also joined um, the IRMA initiative um, last year, where we see, okay, there's an existing certification. So let's see how we can work with it and how we can push that into our uh, supply chain. 
for OECD due diligence across N tier. Yes, we also run those where we say, yes, there needs to be a transparency across the full chain. We have done this for cobalt. We have done that for copper. In many, in many mineral supply chains, there's no NTS certification readily available. So we actively participate in developing and co-developing certification systems. So we believe this is a strong um, 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 push that, uh, that we are happy to support and we need much more engagement there. We have co-founded the Aluminium Stewardship Initiative quite a while back. We are members of Responsible Steel and we, we are also the first OEM who joins the exec executive committee of the GPSNR uh, working on natural rubber. We also see that where certifications are not existing, where due diligence are very difficult, that we, that we look, is there a way to go into direct procurement? So can we go into contracts, into collaboration and specific supply chains? So if you look at, at, at some of the supply chains that we are operating in, um, like for cobalt or for lithium, we took uh, the way into, into having a direct procurement and then being able to know where the raw material is coming from and then passing that on to our supply chain. Uh, so that we are knowing that the source is, um, is, is it's known. Last point is on pilot projects. So uh, we have we, we ran um, a project in, in Bangladesh quite a few years back on Kenaf, which is a material that we need for our for the interior of our vehicles, like a jute um, a material. And we, we are running together with the GIZ um, and with our supply chain a project cobalt for development in DRC to see is there a, is there a possibility to, 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 to do artisanal mining in a way that environmental and social standards are met. So this is a full spectrum. So every time we engage into, into raw materials, we, we, we look what is the best way to, um, to do an intervention and to create environmental and social impact. Next slide, please. So if we are now going into, into breakout sessions, if we are now having um, um, a, 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 a panel round later on, the question is, um, what's our approach if it comes to alliances for responsible sourcing? What are success factors? And uh, um, they are, they are some, somehow twofolds. So on the one side, if it's a responsible sourcing alliance, um, and then if it's specifically on a certification system. And I believe that we do need both. So you see here that, uh, that we believe that open transparent platforms for the interested stakeholders, upstream, downstream civil society are a core element. We strongly believe and we've learned that over the recent years that democratic governance structures, including agreed decision processes between the multi-stakeholders are, are relevant. And obviously, it all needs to be uh, conducted by responsible practices, fair competition, and antitrust regulation. If it then comes to the material level, so looking at really at certifications, so there are a few points that I would like to raise right now, and then happy to, uh, to explore later on in the discussion. So there's a plethora of certification schemes out there. So we strongly believe, please don't create yet another one, but see what of the existing ones can be applied. If it needs, if it's getting applied, there are a few criteria that is crucial for us. It needs to include a mine management, a chain of custody. They definitely have to be developed using a multi-stakeholder approach under the consideration of the ICL guidelines. Um, I followed them through in, in a few initiatives. It's sometimes it might be a pain if you really look at all the different criteria there and getting all the different stakeholders aboard. But at the end of the day, if you really create an atmosphere of trust. In, in the setting and then being able to develop a standard that you then also put under public review. Um, and when you have a governance structure where all parties um, have, a, have a say, have a stake at the table, um, then at the end of the day, the outcome is, is a robust one. And this is, what, this is what we need. We need a chain of custody mechanism um, as part of the certification process, because at the end of the day for us as a downstream user, um, it is critical that we can prove if a material of a part is coming to BMW Group, that this part has, has the credentials of this certification scheme. Balance of interest, I think I already mentioned that. This also includes complaint mechanism so that there's a degree of independence um, um, available. 
Then the question is always, obviously, who's going to be the auditor and the certifier? So uh, the standard provider who's running it, they need to act as an accreditor and not as a certifier itself, so probably um, self-speaking. Um, so that's another requirement um, and, and success factors from, from, from other end, from our end, and it needs to be certified by an autonomous third party. When you're doing all that, the last point here, as I mentioned before, uh, the realization of field projects, of ground projects, so that you really can gather existing um, inputs um, of, of what, is, what is running well, what is not running well, so that you really can test uh, the different aspects. That's also one of the, the sec sec success factors that we, uh, that we incorporated. So I think by that, next slide, uh, that's, that's all for now for a short uh, in, in, in pulse from my end. And I'm very much looking um, for the discussion. Thank you for your attention. Alexander, thank you very much indeed uh, for that uh, introduction to this topic. Uh, shows how many different uh, components are sourced from across the planet to uh, make an automobile. So in a sense, you're an ideal case study of the challenges uh, and the processes we face. And you'll be with us on the panel discussion a little bit later uh, as we uh, explore um, how effective those processes are. But for now, uh, great, thank you very much uh, indeed. Before we move to our uh, breakouts where we want you to just have be able to have a experience share yourself. Uh, we've got, uh, in a sense, one case study from one of those uh, organizations building uh, alliances. And I'd like to bring in uh, Badrinath Veluri, and he acts as president of the Global Rare Earth Industry Association, uh, very much uh, focusing on rare earth elements, value chain transparency, and sustainability on a global level. Um, Badranath, great to uh, have you with us and really interested as we're trying to explore uh, the value and approaches of alliances to hear a little bit more about uh, your work and some of the lessons that are emerging. So uh, Badranath, uh, over to you. Uh, you're still muted. I'm sorry, this is a quite common problem in these days. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks a lot for having a very good introduction and at the same time, very good kickoff for this re responsible sourcing conference. It's very uh, uh, interesting to see all the presentations and the different terminologies across the uh, conference from the start. And a good kick given by uh, uh, Alexander Nick. It's also very interesting. And as uh, Prior to going to this uh, presentation, my name is Badri Nath. I'm now chairing the uh, Rare Earth Industrial Association as a president. It's a very newly born association in 2019 and with the support of EIT raw materials to bring a level playing field across the uh, rare earth industry. And prior to going into that, next slide, please. I would like to introduce what these rare earths are, and you can see the arena of rare earths. Actually, you can you can name it. They exist in every product what we hold or what we are going to use, and the energy transitions which we are talking about. So the materials are there, the collection of materials, and they play a vital role in different products. And if you also see the other perspective of how the value chains are distributed. 95% of the world rare, world's rare earths are produced in a single place which, from China, and it is very well known. And is it good? And is it the one which we is going to get the transparency? That's a big question, which we will walk through through the presentation. And then we can also have much more in detail discussions as uh, the previous presentation also showed very clearly that collective approach is very important and collaborative approach is very important through the global accreditation. So the next slide, please. As, and prior to going to that, click please. Prior to going to that, I would like to explain the different challenges that this value chain is having. The rare earths, as when we call about the rare earths, the first and foremost thing which we get is actually the monopoly. 
And when there is a monopoly in the business, actually, then there comes actually lack of transparency. You don't know where the birth of the material is and how it is processed and where are, what are the various transactions that exist, ultimately creating the market volatility. And when the volatility is going to be considered, it's not just only the supply and demand and not the price, as we are adding the third dimension, that's also the, trans, the, the transparency and sustainability, which is very important, which is very vital. And for the uh, transitions, which we are talking about, click please. And when we have this uh, specific uh, uh, monopoly and lack of transparency, what are the basic things? There is no standards as of today. There are so many standards that exist, but it is not on a global level. It is existing only on a specific local uh, standard, which we don't even understand. They are written in Chinese, most of them. And uh, there is no legislation. What exactly the guidelines they have to follow? Nothing is there. And then what about sustainability? When we are talking about all these things, they say sustainability is, yeah, whatever it is, we don't hear noise, we don't hear. So does it care about the innovation? And that's also what we are going to see where the innovation is also hampered. And a lot of things which we are talking, yes, we are producing innovative products, but the materials are completely non-green and they're not sourced in a responsible way. The next slide, please. So looking at all these things, what is the landscape which we are having? We are having an unsatisfactory transparency and sustainability. And the slide and the image on the right hand side, you can say, I just took one example of how we are talking about the quantification aspects. And a lot of people are talking about when we are getting towards the sustainability, we need a quantification perspective. And when we want a quantification aspect, we need the data, we need the transparency. And at the same time, we need the factual data, no without any tampering and without any manipulation that gives the right methodologies that to quantify which value chain has to be adopted or which value chain has to be selected. So there is no clear indications of no trans, no clear uh, visions that actually it is giving a, a, the right values. So you need, what we need for all these things is actually we, we need a collaboration. Does this exist within the industry, within the rare earth society? This is one of the biggest question. We don't have the collaboration and we don't have the consensus as 90% is old, owned by the one specific global place. So the next one, please. And the new things, which the Chinese export law, which we know it very clearly, and the restrictions are going to be placed and the information will be shared on a required basis and it is scrutinized by the foreign ent the entities, the authorities before it is exchanged. And what happens when this comes into place, nothing, no information will be shared and no technology will be shared. And at the same time, what brings into this is actually the innovation will be hampered. And at the same time, the technology development also along the down the value chain will also be hampered. So it is very important. The only route which we are having with all these things is actually the collaboration, collaborative efforts and with the mutual interest to fulfill the, the sustainability requirements and bring in the transparency that adds true value in terms of circular economy or else in terms of other perspectives that really adds towards the sustainability. The next slide, please. So looking at all these challenges within the rare earths, it is important to bring in the industry together as in the initial speech given by Mosuma, also it's very clear that the industry and the business players plays a vital role and they have been named in the initial stage. So it's very important that the industry has to represent in a collaborative way in order to bring in all these challenges to a reasonable solution, solution mode. So an industrial association has been formed in 2019 with a members, 35 members in the, in the beginning of uh, uh, 2019. In the next slide, please. And why we have established this specific industrial association is it is a association that is covering the entire value chain that is bringing in all the industrial players across the value chain. And it also brings in all the three pillars of research and analysis stakeholders, as well as the strategic solutions together that adds a huge value towards, towards the industry. And that brings in a strong and balanced consensus and along the network, along, along the value chain. And it also develops the sustainability standards that are acceptable 
across the value chain and it also brings in the transparency and the certification as in the previous presentation also it's very clearly mentioned that the standards are to be provided by the accredited so party and it's not just as a certifying this one and so it is very important that we should have association that is representing across the value chain and it is represented by the industrial players the next slide please can you click one so what brings this industrial association with respect to the responsible sourcing is actually the first thing is a glossary that means this common terms common understanding and the common terminology and that brings in to have the standards and the guidelines as a lot of industrial players are talking about that we're working on standards there are so many standards across these materials and the processing of these materials are happening uh, and it is under the framework of tc298 under the iso standards and if you look at the participating countries from europe it is only one and only one country which is participating this shows that actually how thin we are actually in bringing in the practical aspects actually towards so representing uh, industrial association will bring in the standards also bringing in all the consensus across the industry and it also brings in the data security and the protocol perspectives when the information has to be shared within the framework of the guidelines and the standard and the standards in the next click please and which brings in the transparency and the next one and which brings the sustainability quantification when you have the right data when the, the aspects has been shared in a systematic way the quantification and the methodologies also brings in in the right way and why we are talking about the data security and protocol here it is it's very important when it comes to these kind of critical materials and these kind of niche materials which are produced 90 percent in one specific location they are very much afraid of sharing the data and they are very much afraid of their ip aspects so it's very important that actually it has to be framed in within the standards and within the guidelines that this frame this data security has been integrated part of these things that helps us actually in bringing in the sustainability quantifications the next slide please and how we are going to as we said actually that this is one of the biggest thing which it is going on and we would like to bring in the blockchain approach by co covering all these aspects and that's how actually ria is going to founding the, the making the foundation towards the responsible sourcing the next slide and with this i would like to give the stage to peter and uh, i would like to say this is where the journey starts towards building the rare earth industry and i would also like to let you know that actually you might have not seen this kind of image with the greenery and all these things for the within the rare earth industry but we would like to have the rare earth industry with these kind of uh, images not with the dirty images which has been floating around Adrina, thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, really interesting to uh, hear about the work you're embarking upon. A lot of work to be done, uh, I can see, and the demand is only going to increase. And it's interesting, your message around collaboration is seems to be happening in a world that is um, politically has been going in the opposite direction. So it will be quite interesting with these geopolitical forces. Maybe on Wednesday, there will be a shift back towards global uh, collaboration, but we shall see. Um, so uh, with uh, Alexander and Badranath, we hope we've kind of introduced the whole sense of, is there a significant drive and opportunity around those business front run runners being part of building thoughtful expert alliances that are trying to create the conditions where we can achieve responsible sourcing. We're going to have a panel shortly that's going to debate and discuss some of these uh, ideas, but the whole sense of resourcing as a program is that it's very much is about participation. So what we're going to do is to uh, invite you to go back into random breakout groups and we've got a task for you that's going to come up on the screen now. It's a very simple task. We really just want you to spend a little bit of time together. First of all, just getting uh, to know each other, but then also sharing your perspectives on this particular topic and the presentations you've heard already. What, what do you bring to this story about our um, alliances, the real way of creating 
some form of uh, responsible playing field uh, in a complex and competitive world. So we're hoping within your breakout rooms, you will have some experiences to share. What we'd also like is at the end of your conversation, if you could select or agree uh, through collaboration, one person who would write a key insight or a question to go into the chat uh, column of Zoom that will feed into the panel conversation afterwards. Um, could I encourage you to be forthright and uh, uh, thoughtfully robust in your exchanges because we really want to kind of get into this. Are we really seeing the makings of a real difference here or is somehow this all skating on the pond and maybe our previous panel would have said, well, hang on, the reality on the ground is an awful lot different. So what we're going to do is now send you into breakout groups for 15 minutes. Please enjoy that experience, if nothing else, uh, to meet with people you've never met, probably never met before. Then we'll come back after 15 minutes. One key message from each group on the chat and we'll open up the panel discussion to come. So uh, off you go to breakout rooms. Don't forget to unmute and turn on your camera when you get there. Thank you very much, Peter. Well, I think. So everyone is uh, hurtling back from the breakout rooms. One of the few advantages that a facilitator sees in the online process is that when a breakout room comes to an end <laughs> it comes to an end and you don't have to negotiate with the um, in-room facilitator to try and get people back into the plenary so <laughs> uh, there are many downsides to the online experience but that's definitely one of the upsides so I'm hoping that um, the different breakout groups had an interesting conversation um, I'm hoping also that they've uh, nominated somebody who's going to offer a um, thought into the, uh, into the chat, uh, which is going to further stimulate uh, the discussion that is going to come. So as soon as you've got your comment, then add it to the chat. And um, if you've got more than one comment, then add more than one comment. So uh, that's fine. We're just interested in uh, quality, interesting interventions, challenges, questions, whatever. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, uh, is to introduce uh, Tobias Kindripa from WWF uh, Germany, um, who is going to moderate uh, a panel discussion, uh, including our two speakers and uh, others. Uh, really around this issue of effective building of alliances and whether this is really uh, achieving the goal we have around responsible sourcing and maybe also creating that empathy with uh, local situations that uh, was alluded to in the first panel. So uh, Tobias, uh, great to have you with us and uh, I hand uh, the microphone over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Tobias Kindriba. I'm the Global Lead on Mining and Metals within WWF. And I'm really looking forward to this great panel today. Uh, everybody already has their uh, video on, so I don't have to say that. Uh, nice seeing you all. Um, we have our session today on exploring the case for building alliances uh, on challenges and opportunities and strengthening businesses and competitiveness competitiveness and benchmarking responsible sourcing. Um, therefore, we have a lot of great expertise today. Um, and I would be uh, happy, though, to go 
over to the first person to introduce, which is Massimo um, Gasparon. Massimo is the Innovation Director at EIT Raw Materials. Uh, EIT Raw Materials, for those who don't know who that is, this entity is the largest consortium in the raw materials sector worldwide. Massimo coordinates the overall outreach and funding program of the EIT Raw Materials. Um, glad to having you here on board, Massimo. The next one is uh, Julian um, Lagiat, who is the director on government markets and trade in the manufacturing and sustainability team, as well as in the policy and technical affairs team at Intel. Uh, Julian's work is currently focusing strongly on the European Green Deal policy, and he manages global responsible business conduct policy, including business and human rights. Great to have you as well aboard, Julian. Um, the next one is Guy Etier. He's um, representing the Global Battery Alliance as well as the Cobalt Institute. And Guy can look back over 40 years of experience in the field of sustainable development until his last um, retirement in last December, uh, September, right? Uh, he was the senior management, management in the senior management at Unicor, a global materials technology and recycling group, as you all are aware. Glad to have you here as well. And Patrinat and Alexander, you were already, uh, you know, performing basically and having the presentation today. So I don't need to introduce you um, at the moment. Um, we want to kick off um, by having basically the first kind of question on looking into what do you think about alliances and especially what do you think about alliance can support front runners right uh, in the in in tomorrow's first session it will actually in the in the session 4 it will more go into detail about you know regulations and standards the interplay between policies and standards but for today in this session we were focusing on the front runners and and how alliances can achieve those and can support those so my first question would be going to julian if you can you know uh, talk more about uh, about this aspect of it and then i will go further with uh, with all of you to conclude on the questions uh, i just made about the support of alliances in terms of front runners over to you julian um, thanks, Tobias, um, and thanks to everybody for inviting me. Um, I, I would like to say that um, leadership really is a, an important part of this. Um, if I go back to the early 2000s, time of uh, CS, CSR, um, the, the tech industry uh, felt the need to create um, an industry-wide standard on social, environmental, and ethical issues in the supply chain. And um, the founding members, including my company, of what is now the Multi-Sector Responsible Business Alliance, um, saw an opportunity to drive positive change and increase efficiency across the industry with a unified approach. So holding suppliers accountable to a common standard. So that early start really helped us when uh, items like conflict minerals started. Um, this common approach helped us to confront these challenges and uh, also after conflict minerals which is still going on uh, the anti-trafficking um you so say the modern slavery and child labor etc it really helped us this 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 approach um one thing i would say we were lucky in the sense that at one of our last ceos when conflict minerals started uh, 15 or so years ago um he was in charge of our global manufacturing and supply chain and that landed on his desk and he simply took it personally he said that's going out of my supply chain so you do need this uh, and that has helped us as a company enormously uh, coming into these very complex issues and challenges um, so you know that's that minerals focus really helped us to break the barriers in, in this in this space. Um, and you have to accept as well that you, you can't do this alone. You, you need to um, identify and mitigate risks in what are essentially very complex global supply chains. You can't do it alone. Uh, you need to work in these partnerships, alliances, and what is critical is to have multi-sector dialogue as well. Um, this is fundamental. If I go back to the mineral story very briefly, um, we saw what happened in the uh, United States with the Dodd-Frank Act. Yes. So you know when the, Europe was considering- right for the NCP, right? She got it. No, he didn't get it. When Europe was working to introduce similar legislation, we did not want to make the same mistakes 
where uh, companies remove their business from conflict zones instead of keeping their business in there and uh, do it responsibly. So Europe uh, did its responsible minerals regulation and we drove the establishment of what is now the European Partnership for Responsible Minerals, which brings governments, supply chain actors and civil society together to help uh, accompany the European legislation and to increase the demand for and supply of responsibly sourced minerals in, in these areas. So um, this partnership is fully operational. It's got a very strong governance structure and it's funding uh, concrete projects which are having positive impacts in these local communities. For example, giving women access to credit and savings uh, and also to help put in place sustainable uh, mining practices and, and reduce things like mercury pollution. Um, so I, I think leadership is, is important. You have to <laughs> realise that you can't do it alone. You need these strategic alliances and partnerships. Uh, and then also be engaged in shaping the global direction. It's very clear with the European regulation and the EPRM that is shaping the global approach uh, to responsible sourcing of minerals. Um, I think I'm going to stop there and be happy to, to contribute to the discussion later on. Thank you, Julian. Don't worry, you will be. There are a lot of questions in my head already and a lot of questions and comments in the chat. Uh, thank you for that. Please mute yourself if you if you, uh, if you you can. That'd be really great. Um, Guy, the question goes to you as well then in terms of you've been involved in so many alliances as well. So perhaps you can reflect on that and what kind of, you know, how, how actually front runner companies can benefit from that point of view as well. Yeah, well, uh, thanks a lot, Tobias, uh, and thank you very much for uh, for the organizer for this conference. It's uh, so far, it's been uh, it's been really, really great. I, uh, I'm really happy. I, 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 it is an interesting topic of uh, of front runner in alliance, and uh, I'd like to take us on a on a bit of a diverted route. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I, um, I, I think when we need to talk, when we talk about alliances, uh, we need to now in our world, in our society, think about alliances in, in a true partnership of every player of the value chain. We heard some of those elements in, in the conversation earlier. And, uh, and I, I think as we are moving into this new world of uh, low carbon economy that we're trying to achieve the, uh, the Paris Agreement, we cannot allow uh, to make the mistake that others have made in the past. Uh, so, I mean, we're writing the book now uh, for the future and that writing the book for the future uh, encompasses the requirements for all player uh, to be involved. And when I mean all player to be involved, I mean all player on the value chain and those value chain are getting more and more complex. Um, all player uh, from civil society, and that is in itself a challenge because you know it's a resource drain. And maybe that's one of the topic that we need to talk about is how to engage in a meaningful fashion, those that have something to say from civil society. How do we engage the academia? And my, my colleague there from AIT, uh, I'm sure has a lot to say in terms of innovation and new technology. So, I mean, all of those elements are absolutely important. So when we talk about uh, partnership and alliances, uh, we cannot no longer talk about industry alliances. Uh, we have to talk about a connectivity alliance and we have to find the right mechanism to engage those uh, those collectivity alliances and this comes with a number of challenges of learning to talk to each other uh, you know i i have been involved for now four or five years with the global battery alliance and i have to say that over those two or three or four years i mean the big things we've done is try to learn to talk to each other uh, and understand each other and have a collective way of looking at things. And I, I see Alexander smiling there a little bit. He probably knows what I'm talking about. So it, it is absolutely essential that, you know, that we learn that process. And in itself, it is, it is a real challenge. So, and there's a huge anxiety from every player of that value chain or that connectivity to find meaningful way to engage together. So, so uh, 
on a, and I'll finish with this, uh, Tobias, on a, on, on a global battery alliance, we're trying to do this in, in two ways. One is the development of a battery passport. So like you and I now, the battery will have a passport when it comes to the border. Uh, people will know where it comes from. So where it was generated, what type of technology it contains, uh, what's the impact on the climate as it goes along into a life cycle. And the other aspect right now is around cobalt. Uh, it doesn't mean that it needs to address other uh, minerals and natural resources, but you, know, you, have, to, you have to start somewhere. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish here, but I, maybe in our conversation early, later on, if the, the time comes, I, I can give you a vivid example of why all of this has to happen in a pre-competitive fashion, and it is not in a competitive world that we're going we're gonna to achieve success here. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Guy. You were touching on a lot of issues on that. I, I, I have to echo as well, capacity is an issue from my understanding as well. A lot within companies I talk to, uh, whether it's small, uh, medium size, or even big companies I talk to, at least in Europe and Germany, the capacity issue to be in so many alliances as well as in certification and standard schemes has an end in terms of capacity especially up to the to the higher management, right, to, um, to talk about that kind of issue. Uh, the next one would be great to have uh, your thoughts on that, Massimo, as you, you know, have this uh, innovation also as the IT raw materials perspective alliances, but also have the understanding of what happened in the last years and decades. So it would be interesting to reflect perhaps on the you know, changes in the last in the last decade, decade, because there were a lot of been done. And then I will reflect on some of the questions uh, been, been, been asked in the chat. Thanks, Massimo. Yeah, um, one observation that I made while coordinating the European Raw Materials Alliance is that alliances mean very different things to, to different people. In many cases, they have been just, just a banner to get a seal of approval. Hey, I'm part of this alliance, so therefore I'm good, and I'm going to flash this so that everybody knows how good I am. Uh, in other cases, in most cases, I guess, they have been a very important forum to discuss problems, but very often the frustration, especially from the industry partners, is that out of the discussion, nothing comes out. The, 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 of course, it takes a very long time to, to find a common language. I totally agree with, uh, with Guy that that is... Uh, uh, that, that, that is something that needs to be established. It takes a long time to build the trust between the different players. And of course, the more diverse is your stakeholder group, but the longer it takes, uh, that's completely understandable. And, and the group of stakeholders has to be diverse. Otherwise, the alliance is not going to go anywhere. But at some stage, there also needs to be some action. So it's very important that the the alliances operate on two different levels at the, same at the same time. One is really to provide this forum for consultation that needs to be as open as possible, as wide as possible, but then something also needs to happen. So it's very important that within alliances, the different players do get together and start building real projects, start making real changes which of course need to be backed by the policymakers. And again, a very important component of the alliance is that behind it, it needs to have the, 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 the seal of approval of the policymakers so, so that something, if a good idea comes to the fore, it can actually be implemented. There is, there is the political uh, willingness and capacity to implement that idea. So very complex beasts. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, can they do, do they have the ability to to hinder the progression of the front runners? They shouldn't be. They have been in the past sometimes, uh, but definitely they should be something that that will uh, support the front runners. The alliance is there to support creative, innovative ideas and radical changes. At least that this is what we are trying to do with the European Raw Materials Alliance. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, I like the part in the presentation from Batrinat uh, about the closery to have kind of, a, you know, the understanding of each of one, everyone who's actually in the alliance to have, have this kind of understanding because definitely there's no, you know, there's no understanding at the beginning of those alliances because they're different kind of, you know, cultures, different kind of diversity involved, different kind of regions and different kind of parts in the supply chain or 
multiply network if you want so so really like this approach and and i want to go over with what massimo said as well to alexander in terms of uh you know the questions of you know being a front runner in 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 a, in, a, in an alliance uh, maybe maybe difficult as well because some of the companies you are involved with don't go as further as you would like to have the benchmark in the red lines is not for for example which perhaps BMW has in their you know corporate strategy involved so it'd be interesting if you can reflect on that what are you know what are the kind of advantages for a front runner company and what are kind of the burdens and the problems and how can you shift the you know the companies who are not seen to be front runners to become front runners in the future as well to push other companies that'd be something i would be really interested in the point of view from bmw thanks alex well as already elaborated we uh, i strongly believe in alliances so there's no way you cannot do innovation in isolation and i think Guy mentioned that it also needs to be on a pre-competitive level so what we have been seeing, so we have been engaged in, in, in individual activities with individual suppliers, but at the end of the day, we saw, okay, we, we won't get anywhere. So that's why we joined quite a few um, alliances. Um, and uh, it's, it's from a downstream perspective, also critical that we, um, I, I think the point, I think you made the point, resources are not just limited on the, on the civil society side, but also on, on, the, on the corporate side. Um, so like if you, if you operate um, an automotive business um, um, with, with hundreds uh, of, of different materials, uh, so we won't be able to join all those initiatives. Uh, so the question, and it's also a bit what came up here already on the chat, should we seek to, to start with, with very low hanging fruits to get everybody aboard, um, or should we have a pretty high threshold? And your question of how to get also other companies involved, I think it's always a fine line and a balance we need to strive. Because if it's a really multi-stakeholder approach, um, um, obviously NGOs uh, would not like to say, okay, let's, let's go with, a, with the lowest common denominator. Um, and on the other side, if we really start right away with a strong standard, um, there won't be sufficient companies to join. So we have made this experience, and, and as also said, I think from, from, from Guy, there is a lot of trust building um, in those processes. So they need a lot of time. So it's a marathon that we are, that we are running here. If you look at the individual um, initiatives, uh, however, it's at the end of the day, we need, we need to come to, um, to, some, to some output and, 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 to, and, and, and to an agreement. So there are standards out there. So um, um, BMW Group now joined the IRMA standard, so the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. We have not been involved in, in developing it. And that's also one of the points we discussed in our breakout group. So once you put resources into one initiative, um, um, you also need to be able to say, look, there, there are others out there who might even fit better to, to the problems that we are facing. So with the IRMA, we have seen that there's a strong standard out there, multi-stakeholder endorsed, and a standard that also allows um, companies to, 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 um, to perform on different levels. So if we can have standards um, where, uh, where companies who say, you know, I'm not going for 100% right now, it's also valued if you start with 20, 25% of performance and to take it as a, as a kind of learning journey, but the direction of where we want to go to create positive environmental and social impact needs to be clear. Thank you, Alex. And uh, that's a perfect uh, overturn to the question from, from the chat, actually. I, I don't know whether it's you, Alex, who've been involved, but it's from Iris and through Alexander and Mark uh, about the question on which is the best way forward with alliances, given all of the work which has already been done on this. And we may not want to spend another 10 years discussing areas all over again. This kind of reflects on that. So I would like to you know, ask you, Batrina, but also obviously then uh, the whole panelists about what is the way forward? What is the way uh, you know, we need to accomplish in the future and to learn from our past in terms of alliances. So that'd be interesting to reflect on that. And Batrinat, it'd uh, be great if you can go first. Thanks. You're on mute. Sorry, Batrinat. Sorry. As it's mentioned by Gu also, the entire value chain participation is, in, is in very, very important, along with the research institutions and along with the educational institutions. It's very important. So an alliance or an association is not just by the industrial players, even though it is named as industry. 
it is very much required to cover the complete arena to formulate the standards that are acceptable across the value chain, not just at one node of the value chain. That is also valid. And other thing is also there comes an IP perspective when the data has to be shared from one aspect to another aspect. So it also makes a vital role that actually that the one node to another node transactions will be hampered, will be all will be overhauled. So a third part, a standard. I know that Erma has a very strong, a very a huge standard which comprising of 400 pages or something like that. But the thing is acceptance level of across the value chain is also important. Another thing is also the downstream players. If 10 downstream players are asking one upstream player to follow 10 standards, it also makes a huge problem. And this and 10 standards has different glossary and different standards and different methodologies. And as I mentioned, as I showed that it also makes a very confusion in projecting what the implications are coming from this specific methodologies which are adopted in making. So all these things has to be considered in order to bring in a unified approach. And this can only happen when the value chain partners come and stand together and formulate the standards, not by just reinventing the wheels, but it is just to consolidate the things and it is just to bring in the right methodologies together by consensus. And uh, as, as a stake, which as I am representing a small part of the big motors, which is a permanent magnets are rare earth materials. You take the standards which are formulated under the TC298 ISO. How many participants are there within this technical committee is actually very, very less. And especially from Europe, it's only one country which is representing. And this shows that actually our contribution towards this are very weak. Because the only thing is actually we don't have the value chains present within our geographical region. In our group, there has been a question raised by Johannes from an independent uh, consultant from the mining. Are we really interested to look at the materials? Are we, re are we need to look at the regions? That is also that plays a vital role because regional impacts also will be varying from one perspective to another perspective. So it is also important that we also need to cover that in order to bring the level playing field. And if you consider the one, uh, one more thing, within the rare earths, 90% of rare earths coming from one specific location, China, and we all know it, and how much data transparency and how much we are getting actually, and the innovation perspective, how much it is happening. That is also a big question. So it is okay to get the material, but it is also important to know the transparency and it is also very important to know what exactly the impact it's going to happen. So, so all these uh, interlinked aspects and Massimo knows very well about because this topic has been very well addressed in European Raw Materials Alliance. And uh, he can also see very clearly that how innovation has been hampered because we don't have the value chains with, produced within the region. So all these things brings actually a much more uh, differentiation when the alliances are run by the industry. And as a, some of our partners actually during the initiation of this conference also mentioned, the sequence of the responsibility lies within the industry and the business in the primary area. I think others might be having another perspective, but this is what I also noticed, representing an industrial association as well as being a part of the industry too. Thank you, thank you, Bhaskarnath. Julian, you you wanna you wanna add on that? Go go on. Um, well, I, I was going to mention another couple of uh, important uh, things for alliances going forward. Uh, well, one one is the multi-stakeholder aspect of it. Um, if you cannot build like the European Partnership for Responsible Minerals, if you can't build that into the partnership or alliance what you have to do as an alliance is have that dialogue with multi-stakeholders. Um, the EPRM has governments, but supply chain actors, downstream, midstream and upstream, and also civil society. You need to work in, if, if you're improving the living conditions of conflict zones and high risk areas across the world, companies can't do that by themselves. You need to work with civil society who have boots on the ground, in these areas, you need to work with governments who have uh, their infrastructure and are often working in um, these, these conflict zones as well. And then the second point fundamental for alliances is to have a, a very clear and transparent governance structure. 
it's absolutely fundamental, otherwise it collapses. And again, the a case study with the EPRM is that it was set up to help the regulation uh, in Europe on, on minerals supply chains. Um, but it had to become fully operational and to get there took quite an effort. But now you have a very clear governance structure with an operating board, a governance board comprising three of those three pillars. And those that governance board takes a decision on all of the, for example, the projects that EPRM is funding in conflict zones. It, it's a collective decision. It's not Intel taking a decision. It's not the Netherlands taking a decision it, or Solidaridad. It, it's together taking this decision. So the, the multi-stakeholder dimension is absolutely critical. And then the governance structure of your alliances and, and partnerships is also fundamental in my view. Thank, thank, thank you, Julian. Uh, I would go over to Guy to, to reflect on that as well and also to put some parts of the discussion we already had in also from Julia Carbone from IOCN who put in and kind of, you know, reflected on the things Alex said basically on we don't have to, you know, uh, um, uh, reinvent the wheel new. So is it about alignment as well within the alliances? How do we, you know, is that a step forward as well in terms of alignments? How do go, how do these how, how is it possible? Has it been done? What is your kind of expertise on that? What do you think is is is, is the way to, to align those alliances and to strengthen capacity as well, which is a big issue, whether for corporate or for civil society? Uh, no, excellent question, Tobias. Uh, and I, I was thinking also while uh, while you were talking and, and Julian was having this comment that we all always enter into a conflict between the need for result and change and the need for engagement. Uh, and uh, these two are almost in opposite direction in terms of timing. And, uh, and the, uh, the smart reside, needs to reside into making sure that you know, the level of engagement is adequate, uh, that people feel that they are recognized. Uh, we heard this earlier in, in the conversation, very important to recognize. Uh, but yet at the same time that allows, it is conducive to generating some results for the benefit of everybody. Again, I mean, I, I, I think we're all agree here, alliances are not made for industry, they're made for the connectivity. Uh, and they're made for the good of the people, and, and especially in the type of topic we're talking about today, which is, you know, a renewed energy. I think, you know, the essential, our focus is, has to be on the planet. It has to be on, on climate change. And yeah, sure. I mean, industry will find a way to make money and, and, and to grow into this. But at the end of the day, though, the objective is to make sure that, you know, we're all going to be there in, in a couple of centuries from now. And it will only happen if we all work together. So we need to change the rule quite desperately. Uh, and we also need to show results very short term. So it, it, is, a, it is a huge dilemma and conflict and we have to learn to engage with one another the, the one thing that i i know i'm going to be a bit sensitive here but i i needed to put that on the table uh i i don't think anybody holds any veto into this process uh because if it is the case then we cannot engage into alliances and finding common solutions so somehow we have to get into a different way of engaging into a different way of talking to each other and making sure that you know it, it's we all understand the objective and the benefits so i i i think it's a, it's it's a real challenge and again that challenge we don't we don't have the luxury of time but yet at the same time we don't have the luxury of of missing on the credibility so it is a, it is a real it is a real challenge for all of us Thank you. Can can you perhaps explain that more? What do you mean with the veto veto right? So I understand that uh, as well, because obviously in some of the governance structures of alliances, this is an essential yeah. part of the chambers to have a veto right. So perhaps I just misunderstand. So perhaps you can detail that more. Thanks. No, uh, thank you. Thanks for asking for clarity. Uh, I, I was making reference to a conversation I had outside of this context, but I, we heard today uh the uh, the gentleman from uh, from chile into uh, into the session just before the big uh, talking about the right to say no 
uh, by the local population. And sure, I mean, we all have the right to say no, but I, I think that right to say no has to be contextualized. Uh, and it has to be contextualized in the overall value uh, of, uh, of the benefits. I mean, you know, I, we can have macro benefits, we can have macro benefits, uh, and, and, you know, that debate needs to happen. And again, that takes an awful lot of time. So that's what I meant is that, you know, I, I, I'm not sure the saying no and standing on the sideline is for benefit of finding solutions. Uh, but saying no, because, you know, it will have a major impact on people, on population, or on the industry, or on technology, because I, I think that might be the case with some of the technology uh, path that some people may follow, uh, is, is critical. So my point here is, again, Tobias, is uh, this takes time, and that time is in major conflict with what uh, Bedrinat, uh, as as described, which is the need to get results and in, in showing positive positive way forward. Thank you for clarifying that, and I will go over to you, Massimo. I think though the the question though, which is underlining this in our discussion as well, is the question on information for the people on the ground as well as data being shared. Right, this is always an issue with alliances. What kind of data sets are we looking into? Do we actually have data on those issues? Um, and this is also a question for you, Massimo. You can reflect on that uh, uh, for sure. But another question then perhaps be added to you is the, a question which comes from Jan uh, from the Environmental Agency in Germany from their group discussion is how. How can alliances make sure that they deliver real change towards sustainable de development? And this is always has been an issue, uh, not only from data point of view, but how, how can you make actually sure that there has been an impact and you can show those impacts and not only having something on paper to to, to say it a bit sarcastically. So if you can reflect on that, Massimo, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll take the question also as a way of reflecting on what Key was saying. And to me, the key point there is to be able to demonstrate what is the cost of not doing something as opposed to what is the cost of doing something. So when we think about that and when we extend that reflection to not only to the cost in terms of a revenue or potential loss of revenue or potential loss of profit, but also the environmental cost of the social cost of engaging in a certain operation or not engaging in a certain operation. So if we can demonstrate that in a very simple way and quantify that in a very simple way, then it becomes a lot easier to make the decisions on whether to go ahead or not with a certain project. And then it becomes easier to have that conversation uh, about the, the, the vetoes that, that, that Guy was talking about. So to me, that, that's a very important point uh, of the alliances. Uh, it's, it's an important thing that alliances should just try to achieve. Uh, for the second part of the question, how do we make sure that, uh, that some results are actually delivered and, and that, that, that things actually happen? Uh, it, it also goes back to what many of the other speakers have talked about. You need to have uh, different players involved. You need to have a high level of independence. And again, this concept of trust, building trust to me is very much goes, goes hand in hand with, with the concept of having a strong governance and the strong governance needs to be an independent entity uh, because the moment the Alliance is seen mm -hmm. as, uh, as a lobby group of one of the stakeholders, so then it loses its credibility, it falls on the ground. So independence, uh, trust, and strong governance and the, the, um, at the end of the day, if we can get all the stakeholders behind certain projects and certain concepts and certain initiatives, then if the whole community is behind it, that's the kind of message that we can then give to policymakers so that things can happen. That's the message that we can give to financing institutions to show that the project can go ahead. It's not gonna have an opposition halfway down the track. So to me, that, that, that is the very key element to get everybody behind a few very simple points and then start from there with things that we find everybody in agreement and while doing so, and I'm talking here about how do we, how do we hit the ground running while we still have a conversation, let's start the building trust around a few 
projects around a few ideas, a, a few practical uh, outcomes of the Alliance, and uh, hopefully that, that can grow over time to include the more projects. So once we start talking to each other and we see results, we see money flowing in into the industry, we see benefits for, for the people involved in the projects, we see benefits for, for the environment as these projects are going ahead, then that, to me, that's the, the way forward. Thank you very much for that, Massimo. That was great. And in the first part, you, you touched base also related to risks, right? In terms of being involved or not being involved for a company or an entity, what, what that actually means is the risk part. And I'd be, I'd be glad to hear something on that on Julian's part from, from Intel. So, I mean, you touched base quite, quite you know, logically in terms of leadership, obviously, right? You know, as well as Alex did that with BMW, it's, it's in the strategic and uh, sustainability is a part of their, of their business model. But, you know, also the multi-stakeholder part, the collaboration part and the corporate governance was something you touched base on, but I'd be really interested in terms of the risks uh, as your company saw that and how risk was related then to 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 get involved as a front runner company in an alliances and what kind of risk were associated for that not to being in those alliances or what were kind of risk you can mitigate by being in an alliance yeah that, that's that's that, that's a good question um i think uh to a certain extent you have to work together in these the, the alliances and partnerships in order to uh, if you like, spread, spread, spread the, the risk, risk, but just to be able to identify it and, and mitigate it, you you have to work in the in the partnerships. I think that's critical. You're muted, Tobias. Thank you, Andy, for telling me that. I was putting a button. Can you elaborate more on that? That'd be interesting to 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 see. Um, how how that started in the beginning uh, as you as you touch base uh, in in in, uh, in the beginning of our uh, panel from a yeah point as, as I said earlier I, th I think um, that there was originally an understanding that um, there were uh, the social environmental and ethical risks out there as I said earlier when CSR first started around the the early two thousands uh, this is where we obviously wanted to identify risks and work together first as a technology sector, but subsequently with other sectors to um, work to identify and mitigate those risks, which ultimately um, resulted in the, the responsible, what is now the responsible business alliance. And that, that common approach has helped us deal, you know, our sector, the tech sector, I think there's no big secret, it was held up in the public spotlight uh, because of conflict minerals and of course the tech industry wanted to do something about that and so um, they adopted a very proactive stance on that which you will have seen on the 3TG but it's as I said to quite a lot of people it's not just about conflict uh, conflict is incredibly important and shouldn't be underestimated but it's also about other things in the supply chain so um, for example, child labor, modern slavery, etc., mercury pollution at mines, whatever it should be. So the, 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 the approach, you know, there's, a, there's also a certain level of expectation these days. Um, you know, response, I think the RMI BMZ conference last week, people were saying responsible sourcing should be the norm. And there's a level of expectation on companies from their uh, shareholders and investors uh, that you're on top of this and doing the right thing so um, yeah I mean you, you need to uh, get to grips with this it's fundamental because at the end of the day it is it is your business and without uh, identifying and mitigating risks you're, you're not going to attract um, you know investment and more business Thank you very much for that, Julian. And to clarify that, uh, I have a question for Batrinat as well, but also I want to reflect on Rebecca's part from Irma in the um, in the in, in the chat. Uh, it's rather uh, 400 requirements than 400 pages, and, and uh, sorry, didn't uh, touch a nerve there. Um, but Batrinat, uh, also a question 
um, on you would be exactly kind of an issue which is exactly on rare earth, uh, which I'm interested in, but also this goes for a lot of other commodity. We can do that with iron ore, for example, 50% out of China and so on and so forth. So there are different kinds of alliances and different kinds of continents. And it'd be interesting how to relate those in, in the way of you do try to do as well as the European Union. So how do you align with different kinds of alliances in different kinds of areas, which are really, you know, kind of a monopole situation. Uh, it's it's rather different in, in, in the sphere of copper, for example. So I'd be interested in how, how this is done in the rare earth part. And you are mute again, as well as I did before this kind of. As I mentioned, uh, as everyone also mentioned, it's very important that we need to have an engagement and we need to have actually alliances to come not to compete with each other, it is to coordinate with each other, to bring in the right perspectives that adds to the society. And it's not just to the industry as we also mentioned and Masimo also stand on the same point. So it's very important if we really want to be innovative, we also need the value chains to be present in regional areas. And in order to bring those regional areas to be alive within the value chains, how we need to do the things is also very important. And if you see rare earths, 90% are coming from one specific chi out of China. And we can clearly see that some of the industries are clearly de deviating that actually we don't want to use rare earths and we want to use something else other than this. Then they're putting actually the, the, the pressure on different other materials than the, than the other materials, which are rare earths. So I know that actually some people will debate on that but I don't want to go into that specific mode, but we need to find a solution mode that actually how we can make sure that those materials will add the value to the society in bringing in the green transitions through a sustainable value chain, through developing a by doing the responsible sourcing. Second thing, I fully agree that actually 400 requirements as I, Irma Rebecca was mentioning, 400 requirements, yes, 400 requirements is also good, but how much we can quantify that and instead of qualitatively representing that is also needed as Massimo was also mentioning, do the specific points that will make a huge impact that brings actually innovation and that brings actually the diversification into place. So that makes actually much more uh, advancements within the value chains. And that also brings in actually when the diversification comes in, so Competitiveness also grows in, and when the competitiveness grows in, actually then you can make much more innovative uh, perspective progress. So otherwise, actually we will just make sure that actually uh, we are simply playing with the cost aspect that we are not, uh, we are killing the innovation perspective. That's also there. That's also what we noticed within the value chain of rare earths. Thank you, Badrinath. Um... A last question to Guy before we go into kind of having the last question and we put it on the uh, kind of on the paper uh, would be you've been kind of on both sides right uh, and uh, you're retired now so you can speak freely. Uh, <laughs> you've been working for Umiko as a company before now you are working with Battery Alliance having seen both parts of the aisle. Um, what would you say it kind of faces the problems for a company being a front runner in 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 a in a in a in an alliance, and what kind of is the problem to having an alliance with not enough front runners in it? Um, perhaps uh, you can can reflect on that uh, as well as I see both challenges with those. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks for putting me on on the on the spot here. Uh, well, let me start from from the, the company perspective, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you a story. Uh, when I was an executive at Umicor, uh, you know, I firmly believe in uh, that you know we can distinguish ourselves uh, as being a little bit more proactive from a sustainability point of view, have strong standards and and strong policy approaches and. And when it comes to our uh, procurement uh, policies, especially in the raw material, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, in may, having those that were making a choice, choosing choosing us because you know we're we're the good guys and others were the bad guys. Well, at the end of the day, I <laughs> strongly discovered that. Uh, what makes a difference was the price, and uh, and I think uh, Badrinat was uh, was alluding to that a little bit. So it made me realize that we have no choice but work together if we want to change something. So 
flip side of the coin is, uh, you know, as an Indus, as an alliance, uh, as the battery alliance, I, I really think my challenge is to bring as many players as possible into this alliance that believe uh, that, you know, the solution for, and again, for the climate, because <laughs> that's what we're talking about here, uh, resides in having all the players together uh talking to each other and finding solutions to the, the the issue we have in front of us and we have for the future so i uh, you know I, from an industry point of view i've realized that it, it is not uh, a good tactic to try to turn the word in umicor was turn sustainability into a competitive advantage it was not a good tactic but it, it is a good tactic to bring all the players together to find a collective solution, because at the end of the day, it is always going to be the lowest common denominator that drag the rest from a reputational point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Uh, I didn't want to put you in the spotlight, uh, <laughs> um, but thanks, thanks for doing that. And uh, uh, Constance, it'd be great if you can share the um, the slide where we can fill in kind of the the, the statements um, of each uh, panelist. And thank you for. Uh, for that. Um, Alex, perhaps you want to start with in terms of, you know, the one suggestion in terms of, you know, for Alliance to support front runners and the businesses and business cases for responsible sourcing in the future. If you can paraphrase that in a way, that'd be great. Well, yeah, first some more context and then the paraphrase. Sure. Go ahead. Um, because some some um, some thoughts got got uh, got to, to the previous speakers. So for me, it is a is a holistic, a systemic point of view. So we have now talked quite a lot on standards on sourcing, but um, obviously we first need to look at technology and R and D, as well as 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 approaches in circular economy. Uh, like when we are seeing that there is a material like rare earth, um, which has now been mentioned quite a few times, that is heavily dependent on one country. So the question is obviously what ways do companies ha do have to reduce the risk of sourcing from that one country and with all these environmental and social um, aspects related to it. So at, at, at BMW, um, we, we took this serious. So we developed an electric drive train where, we, where you don't need rare earth. So instead you have another technology which uses copper. So then obviously the question was, how is it with that industry? But the question is always, where do you believe you, 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 you have a balance at the end of the day that, that there's an approach that works um, to, um, to ensure environmental and social standards. So if it now comes to, to the one succession is really um, go behind one standard it needs to be one which has a lot of criteria because otherwise it, be, it, is, it is too vague. And as I said before, for me, there's now a standard out there and this is IRMA. So we should see if that fits to, 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 to many occasions because otherwise from a downstream and probably also from a civil society perspective, at least where we have hundreds of materials, we are not able to follow standards for so many different materials. So we would need to reduce to a few. Thanks, and passing back to Tobias. Thank you, Alex. So I will be develop a standard, a standard which has a lot of requirements, um, reflecting on all the issues such as you know sourcing, um, um, you know uh, the, all the issues we talked about before in the other sessions as well when it comes to livelihood and and and, and benefiting of systems and yeah, stuff. We'll develop one. So it's now here on paper here. There's a standard out there, so we don't need to develop one. Yeah, no, 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 not a develop. Why? Sure. Yeah. Apply the use, use of usage of a standard uh, uh, alliance. Uh, we we kind of got into the cold discussion about the alliances and standard in between. I think you made it quite clear what actually the difference is as well as BMW did that in, in, in your presentation. So we put that together for, for now because you already uh, said that you are involved in a couple of them, such as Irma, for example, when it comes to the to the sourcing. Um, Julian, you want to you want to go you want to go next? Uh, yes, I came off mute, so I guess that's my hand up. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I guess one thing it might, might be obvious, but it is important. You really need to have the right players involved, and the um, European Partnership again for Responsible Minerals, highly successful, fully operational even before the European regulation came into effect. Um, fantastic! It's it's performing well in conflict zones and high risk areas, but I think those who are involved acknowledge there are clear gaps. And so, for example, this year, the focus of the EPRM is to reach out to producer countries. So where, where the minerals are sourced from and bring them 
into the partnership, which is actually a global partnership, not just a European partnership. Um, you, you can say, well, where are the other governments? There's the Netherlands, Germany, and the UK. Okay, so more governments. Uh, there's more upstream needed. Uh, where are the banks? Where are the investment? Where's the investment community? Um, there's a great section of downstream companies across different 3TG consuming sectors, but you know where there's automotive, there's there's tech. Where's construction? Where's aerospace? Where are the other sectors? So where is well, there is some dialogue with academia. Um, I think if you want to have a, an effective alliance or partnership, these uh, stakeholders actually either need to be part of the partnership or the partnership or alliance needs to have that dialogue because it's absolutely critical. Perfect. Thank you very much. We, we already run out of time. So Massimo, uh, Guy and uh, Batrinat, uh, try to be neat uh, on that. Batrinat, perhaps you can, you can go first. Yeah, uh, glossary is very important so that the whole industry will stand on a single uh, words, not just by floating around the things. So having a unified glossary is very important. So your mutual understanding, right? Yes, that brings in mutual understanding and every uh, and brings in a huge engagement, as Gui was mentioning a lot of times, engagement from different sectors and different participants is very important along the value chain. And uh, I strongly uh, support the word Julian made, actually the downstream plays a vital role in bringing in all these things to life. Mm. So downstream has a much more uh, stake. Yeah. Thank you. Aaron was reflecting on that as well from the uh, from the Chilean um, um, part of place today in the, in the other session before. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Batrinat Guy, and then Massimo for the final statement. Ma yeah. So, sorry. Yeah, I was uh, I was looking for my unmute button. I, you know, I, I it's strange because I, I I'm not sure I like the question. I, one suggestion for Alliance to support front runner. I don't think that the objective should be to support front runner. It, and from my point of view, one suggestion for Alliance, it should be to have a common objective, hmm. uh, a very clear common objective to achieve. And then, you know, people will fall under that. And don't worry, you know, business will find the business case to, to do the business. And, and the front runner, if they think they need to be front runner, they continue to be front runner. But for the Alliance, you need to have a, a common cause. And that, to me, is the most important element. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that as well and reflecting on that. Um, we kind of looked into the front runner for that session and the session tomorrow is more looking into Alliance and the structure of those. Um, and also to hear more from business uh, businesses about the front runner part. So um, the last one, uh, but not least, obviously, Massimo, uh, you have the, have the last one before we go over to Peter. Yeah, one minute. So two things. One is that the ability to provide a real estimate of the social, environmental and economic cost of doing something as opposed to not doing something. And then on a more pragmatic way, money. Most projects will need the financing, so the ability to provide the financing. So there's, there's of course, a lot of uh, uh, good discussions that need to be had, but uh, there's also projects that need to hit the ground. So an alliance should be able to provide the means for projects to turn into, into reality. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for your great input uh, and for, you know, to put everything together like for 55 minutes. And it's really un-German for me to be over time now, three minutes. So Peter, please, um, I'm really deeply sorry for that. I hope you can forgive me on that. And thank you to uh, Batrinat, Alex, Guy, Massimo and Julian for your input and um, happy to to have you on board in the resource project. And over to you, Peter, um, to, to finalize today's uh, day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Tobias, thank you very much. And you are forgiven uh, because of the high value of the conversation that you were uh, moderating. So really interesting, further insights and unusual insights, I think, coming through as well. We're at, at the end of day one of our conference, um, having spent time uh, really framing the discussion, looking around awareness building and advocacy, and also then looking at front runners and uh, business alliance. Alliances. Tomorrow, 
we're going to drive forward and we're going to look at that interplay between regulations and standards, between policy and uh, industry-led uh, activities. Um, is that a, a supportive or conflicting relationship? We're also going to look at the vital role potentially of investment and, and stock and commodity market markets in driving change towards responsible sources. And we're going to try and draw the strands together in terms of some key thoughts about the way forwards that also feed into giving the resourcing projects a real uh, dynamism. We hope that you've uh, enjoyed the day with the limitations of the format that we hope that you've uh, felt uh, engaged. Uh, we'll certainly want to get some feedback from you at the end of the conference. But for now, if I could thank all the speakers and panelists and moderators for their involvement. We start at 10.15 uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Central European time. So uh, have a good night's rest. Try not to look at a small square sc uh, screen all evening. And we will see you uh, for day two of the resourcing conference at 10.15 uh, through to 10.30 tomorrow morning. Thank you all very much for your participation and Good morning, good evening, or whatever. <laughs>